Okej, okay, vad är det då vi har gjort om vi ska försöka summera här? Jo, vi har ju pratat om hur delaktighetskulturen skapar nya förutsättningar. Vi har pratat om hur stressen som följer av realtiden kan öka och för oss att må dåligt ibland. Och vad vi kan göra för att må bra igen. Vi har också gått in på hur realtidsutvecklingen påverkar krig och politik och integritet och hur vi förändrar vårt beteende och börjar berätta mer och mer om oss själva. Vi har också pratat om närvaro och efter, efter Daniel Strasers genomgång här är vi alla sjukt närvarande. Kan vi vara mer närvarande än vi är nu? Ja, kanske är det för att vi går in i en värld där internet på något sätt ligger som ett filter över vår verklighet. Internet kommer vara ständigt närvarande var vi än vi rör oss. Men den här utvecklingen den går också motsatt håll. Vi säger att fysiska saker kan börja att bli spelbara. Och nu ska vi gå över på länk till USA där Jesse Kjell som leder spelföretaget Kjell Games han sitter i Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania ska prata mer om detta. Jag ska ställa mig här ska vi se om vi kommer igång på engelska. And I will switch to English as well. And let's see. Good morning, Mr. Shell. Good morning to you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, thanks. Okay, It, great. Hang on. Okay, hanging on. There we have you. It's very nice to have you with us, Mr. Shell. Okay, I'm glad I can uh, be here. Glad I can help out with this. Mm. I hope you can get a glimpse of the audience as well. We, around yeah, 300 can, people can, here. Yeah, I can see you guys just fine. Nice. So we're eager to hear what you have to tell us. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, sort of where I think uh, games are going when it comes to Uh, some of the things that are happening with social networks and the relationship between social networks and gaming. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut over to some slides here and talk over uh, the slides. So give me just one second to get that going. Okay. And okay. Can you see those slides okay? Okay, great. All right, so the name of this talk is Beyond Facebook, the Future of Pervasive Games. And uh, the reason I kind of focus on Facebook here is because the game industry has really been shaken up by Facebook uh, over the past year. Um, a year ago, people saw Facebook games and they thought they were kind of cute and they thought maybe something would happen there. But we've seen a massive kind of expansive rush uh, happening Uh, in the in the monetization of Facebook games, and it's interesting to kind of look at that, think about that, and think about what might be next. So, in order to understand that, I think it helps to understand some of the Facebook math. So, uh, here's a piece of Facebook math for you: F V is greater than T, and what that means is that Farmville has more players than there are Twitter users. So what does that tell us? That tells us that Facebook is really big. The um, number of Farmville players has been varying between somewhere between 90 million and 120 million players. And for a game that's less than a year old, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of an astonishing thing, the, the sheer number of people who are playing these games. Um, so here's another piece of Facebook math for you. LG lead generation is greater than DP direct payment. So what does this mean? So there are two different ways that uh, people collect money when they make Facebook games. The, the most obvious one is direct payment. Now, Facebook games are unusual. Um, retail games, you pay up front. You pay when you, when you buy the game. Um, then there were a lot of online games with a subscription model where you pay each month. Facebook games are very different. You, you play for free. And then there are certain uh, objects and things, if you want to, uh, you can buy with cash money. 
And you think, okay, well, that's a little unusual, but at least I understand it. But it turns out that that's not where most of the money comes from for people who are making these games. Most of the money comes from something much stranger called lead generation. So here's an example of some lead generation offers here. Um, so for, these are some Farmville examples. Sign up for a credit card and get 475 farm cash. Um, install a toolbar on your browser, get 19 farm cash. Uh, play this photo hunting game on somebody else's website and get 10 farm cash. So more than half the revenue that these companies are getting seems to come from these lead generation opportunities. One of the uh, one of the uh, most prominent ones recently had been Microsoft uh, had made an arrangement with uh, with Farmville, whereby uh, if you became a fan of their new search engine Bing, it would uh, you'd get some farm cash. And Microsoft found this was the most effective of all their marketing campaigns for the Bing uh, search engine. So what does this tell us? It tells us that Facebook is strange. Um, making games on Facebook is uh, the economics are just very different than what we're used to. So here's another piece of Facebook math: EA, which is Electronic Arts, minus 1,500 full-time employees plus Playfish, minus 300 million dollars equals what in the world is going on here? Um, so we had a day uh, a few months back where in one day Electronic Arts laid off 1,500 employees and at the same day they purchased the relatively small company Playfish um, and uh, they purchased them for $300 million. And uh, this is, I think, very symbolic of kind of the how things are changing in the game industry. And uh, so, you know, a lot of us found this kind of scary and terrifying. Um, that, that to see things change like this. So it's certainly true that Facebook is terrifying. So there you go. Here's my ad for Facebook. Facebook, it's big, strange, and terrifying. But, well, maybe it's not completely fair to say terrifying. Maybe a better word would be unexpected. Um, we didn't expect that we was going to have such a dominating effect on the, on the game industry. It would be such an area of expansive growth. But, you know, it's not the only thing that's been surprising us lately in the game industry. A lot of things have been surprising us. Uh, when Mafia Wars came out and was very successful, yeah, it's a Facebook game. I mean, that, that, was, that was very surprising. And not just because it was Facebook, but because, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a text-based game that, that made an awful lot of money. Farmville, of course, you know, that was surprising. Club Penguin's not a Facebook game, but it's an online game that was very surprising. Um, a simple flash-based game that started collecting six dollars a month and ended up getting, uh, you know, over a million subscribers and ended up getting purchased by the Walt Disney Company for three hundred and fifty million dollars. That was surprising. The success of the Wii was surprising. It used to be people expected that the uh, the 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 console with the uh, with the the best graphics would be the one that that sold the most units and now we have an inverse relationship the the console with the with the worst graphics is the one that's the most popular the Wii Fit was very surprising the Wii Fit has uh has uh sold i think to this to at this point 2 billion dollars of revenue it, it is created you know it's it's a it's a nice little thing but you know to to make that much revenue is kind of unexpected guitar hero you know a, a toy plastic guitar with rainbow buttons becomes one of the number one games you know and it, and it costs you know much more than a normal video game uh webkins where you you know you buy a stuffed animal and then you can go online for free and this ends up being like a huge phenomenon and uh, uh, the the whole achievement systems um, that uh, have on on uh, on Xbox 360 have been very unexpected. People didn't expect that was going to be so so popular. So it's interesting to think about what do these unexpected things all have in common? Well, the thing that they all have in common is that they are bre breaking out of the virtual world and into the real world. Um, Mafia Wars and Farmville are all about. Uh, connecting with your real friends, so is Club Penguin, connecting with real people. The Wii and the Wii Fit and the guitar here are all about real emotions. Webkin's about a real stuffed animal. So all these things are kind of about breaking into reality. And that's kind of strange for us.
game, game designers are not completely comfortable with reality. Uh, we're used to fantasy. Um, ben Gordon was, you know, once talked about, uh, you know, what people always asking for more realism in games. And he said, you don't want realism. People, people go to games to escape reality. So it seems strange to us when we see, uh, when we see reality breaking through into games and it's a little difficult to figure out what to make of it. But it's not just happening uh, here in games. It's happening everywhere. If you look at what's happening on television, the people in television, are, their heads are spinning. They're used to kind of making up stories and fantasy worlds. And now television's all turning into reality television. Uh, groceries, you know, you go to the store, you buy some food. Well, now it's all about organic groceries, groceries that are more real and more genuine. And, of course, you know, our old American standby, the Big Mac, you used to go to McDonald's and buy the Big Mac. No, you don't, you don't, no, now they want to sell you the Angus burger, a more real burger. So there's this push for reality in everything. And um, what really made it come together for me was this book called Authenticity uh, by Gilmore and Pine, where they point out the fact that, you know, in, in society and culture right now, the most important thing for any product is to be authentic and to be real. It's what people want more than anything else out of their products and out of their experiences. And uh, so, you know, why? Why now? What's, what's happening now? Well, what seems to be the case, you know, what they're partly arguing is, is that we're cut off from nature, that we had, we went, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been getting more and more and more virtual. And all this virtual stuff that we've been kind of getting into has been pushing us farther and farther away from nature to the point that we kind of have this hunger to kind of connect with anything that feels real, um, even if it isn't very real. Because, you know, we live, you know, in this bubble of like fake bullshit all the time. Um, we're just constantly surrounded by things that are like fake and cut us off from nature. And if the best we can do is to get like a, you know, a... Uh, 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 a mocha coffee at Starbucks that has real Swiss chocolate, we'll take it because it seems more real to us than what we're, what we're used to. And we're seeing that, I think, in, in games too. I think that's where a lot of the push for reality is coming from. And, of course, it's going the other way. Not only are the games kind of breaking out into reality, but reality is like pushing backwards into the games. So, for example, fantasy football... Uh, has become uh, incredibly popular. It used to be sort of a niche phenomenon, a little bit of a little nerdly game for nerds, but not anymore. It's it's a, it's the thing that almost everybody is playing. It's it's incredibly huge in the U.S. Um, geocaching has become huge. Uh, it used to be it was good enough to go for a walk in the woods, but you know it's more fun when there's a treasure chest at the end. So going for a walk in the woods has become a game. Watching television has become a game. When The Simpsons had their 20th anniversary, Fox decided they would do a special promotion where they would hide a Simpsons reference in every show that they had on television that week. And if you could record them all, you'd, you'd win a prize. Um, uh, in, the, in the United States, we, we have this group, DARPA, that does sort of defense research. They wanted to figure out best techniques for crowdsourcing. Um, they could have done your normal research, but instead what they did is they made it a game. They just hid 10 balloons all around the country in different places, and they made it a contest to see uh, who can find all 10. And they, this became their crowdsourcing experiment. So research is becoming a game. Uh, weight Watchers, a very popular system for, uh, for losing weight, so it used to be a straightforward program. Now they have this calculator system that, seems, that feels very much like a game when you play it. And uh, even driving a car, you know, so here's the uh, Ford Focus dashboard. This is a hybrid car, and mostly, you know, it looks like a pretty normal speedometer. Um, but if you look way over on the right, you see this little plant thing here, and you wonder, what is that? Well, it turns out it's a virtual plant, and the more gas you save when you drive, the more the plant grows. So it's like a virtual pet in your car, and it changes the way you drive. So what I think is interesting is when game designers start to get involved in this stuff. Um, so Lee Sheldon is a, is a 
been in the game design industry for, for about 20 years or so. He's a very, very successful designer. He started teaching at University of Indiana, and he came up with a new grading system because he thought the old one was terrible. He didn't think it was properly motivating. So he came up with one that was more familiar to him. He used an experience point system. You start out with zero experience points, and every assignment you do, instead of just getting a grade and averaging the grades, you get experience points, and you level up through the class. Uh, since he started doing this, he found that uh, class attendance is up. Uh, homeworks are completed more often and more on time. Students seem more engaged in the class. It, it feels you know, like an improvement with, through better game design. And then you've got all this stuff. Coffee points and airline points and shopping points and gas points uh, and, uh, just, uh, and just all kinds of points. These points are out there everywhere. Everyone's trying to make everything into some kind of little game, but these games are terribly designed. Think how the world starts to change when game designers start to get a handle on these points and making them work more effectively and integrating them together into, into tighter systems. Because what's happening is sensors are kind of pervading uh, our lives. We're getting more and more sensors in new ways. Some of the new ones that are coming out in the game world, we have the, uh, the Microsoft's uh, Project Natal, which is a three-dimensional camera that sits on top of your television set, and it, so you can use your whole body as a controller. The Nintendo DS uh, has two cameras on it. We don't, we don't totally know what they're for yet, but people will figure it out because these sensors are getting cheaper, and the more things you can sense, the more things you can make a game of. And we're getting into the area of uh, disposable technology. Um, if people remember the toy, the Furby, there's lots of these little robot toys now, and they're, they're relatively inexpensive. That toy had more technology in it than it took to put a man on the moon. And it was $20, and we throw it away when we're tired of it. And so technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. So we're moving to the area of disposable technology. It won't be very long before every soda can, every cereal box, uh, you know, every, every bar of soap that you buy is going to have some kind of sensor or something in it that's going to be able to uh, – you're going to be able to interact with. There will be some kind of screen. It may have a camera and a Wi-Fi connection so that it can keep you – so that it can connect to the Internet. And so when that happens – what does this world start to look like? Well, I think it looks something like this. You wake up in the morning and you go to brush your teeth and, you know, hey, good job. You just got 10 points for brushing your teeth. Right? Because your, your toothbrush is Wi-Fi connected and it just kind of uploads that you brushed your teeth. And, in fact, it's, it's, it's got a timer, so it's measuring. You know, hey, you, you brush your teeth for three minutes. Good job for you doing that. Um, and... Uh, and then uh, you brush your teeth every day this week, so you get points for that. Now, why would anyone want to give you points for that? Well, the thing is, the more toothpaste you use uh, and the more frequently you brush your teeth, the more toothbrushes and toothpaste you go through, so it's in the best interest of the, uh, the toothbrush company. And already you can see Oral-B, the, 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 they make a lot of toothbrushes. They have one right now that already times you and lights up with a little happy face if you hit a two-minute brushing period. And there's another company that makes a bathroom scale that every time you weigh yourself, it automatically uploads the weight to a database. And you can even configure it to, uh, to put your weight on Twitter. I don't know why you'd want that, but you could do that. And so, so we're, we're going to see that happening with, uh, with toothbrushes very soon, I'm sure. Anyway, so then you go to breakfast, right? And, and there's your, your box of cereal. And it used to be you'd read... Uh, you know, you'd read the, the, the words on the back of the box, but now there's a game there you can play, an interactive game. And since the Cornflakes box is online, uh, you know, you're going to get points for playing the game, you know, good for you. And you can see who, which of your friends are online, and hey, points for you because you just beat your friend's score, right? And maybe you can even have a chat with your other friend who might be having Cornflakes right now. Um, and, of course, you get points for eating some cereal. It's got a tilt sensor, so it can tell when you tip the box. So bonus points for eating the cereal, too. And then you go to work, and you get on the bus. And the bus? I don't want to take the bus. But, of course, you're going to take the bus because the government will give you, you know, special bonus points uh, for using public transportation. And while you're sitting on the bus, you know, you're know you going to play a little game or something. You, you'll play a, you'll probably, you, you could play Tetris, but instead you're going to play, I don't know, you'll play a... 
Coketris or something, you know, a free Coca-Cola themed uh, Tetris because that one's free. And while you're playing it, you think to yourself, you know, hey, that reminds me, I had a dream last night that my mother was dancing with like a, a Pepsi can. And, and then you realize, oh, it's the Remtertainment system that I, I installed. Um, so Remtertainment works this way. You put a little sensor in your ear that can tell when you've entered REM sleep. And when you've entered uh, REM sleep, it automatically starts putting commercials into your ear to affect your dreams. And if you can remember the dreams and, and type them in uh, on, you know, on, your, on a browser, on your, on your phone, you'll get, like, you know, you'll get big points for, for uh, remembering the dreams. And the funny thing is the more you do it, the more easily the commercials can go into your dreams, which means the more points you get. So then you get to work. Hey, good job. You're on time. Nice. Very good. And hey, in fact, you've been on time all week. So you get uh, special bonus points uh, for that. And then there's your uh, office mate, right? And, and he says, hey, check it out. I got, I got one of these new e-ink tattoos, new digital tattoo. Um, I can uh, change out the image whenever I want. And in fact, I've configured it with Tattoogle AdSense, right? So that like, I get paid by, for putting these ads up. And you look at him and you're like, that's, that's kind of dumb. You put it so high on your arm. Everyone knows Tattoogle AdSense has light sensors in it. And if it's covered up, you're not going to be getting any points from, from Google on that. And so you show him yours, which is much lower on the arm. And just then, like you notice that your tattoos, because they're both on Tattoogle AdSense, they're matching. And so you say, link sync and and. And the, sy the system hears you, right? It's got a microphone. It hears you. And he looks at it, and they're both ads for Pop-Tarts. So he says, Pop-Tarts. And, and then you do a high five because the body electricity system can sense when you touch each other. And so you get points for the link sync and points for Pop-Tarts and points for the high five. And why would there be a game like this? Because we normally, when there's ads that we see all the time, we start not to see them. We get banner blindness, but when you have games that draw your attention to that makes people pay attention, makes them much more effective. So it's time to go to lunch. And uh, you've been drinking Dr. Pepper all week. So, you know, you know, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper. So, of course, you're going to have another one today, you know, and get more points because, you know, there's a special this week where if you drink five Dr. Peppers, you know, you get big bonus points. You can use it at the grocery store. So you're definitely doing that. And then you've got a meeting in another building, and you could take a shuttle over or catch a ride with somebody, but uh, your health insurance company is giving you a pedometer, and uh, if you walk more than a mile a day, you know, you get points, which give you a deduction on the expense of your, your uh, health insurance. And if you get your heart rate over a certain amount, you know, hey, more bonus points for you. And then you go to the grocery store on the way home. Um, and, and this is such an incredibly complicated mess of points and offers and opportunities. You don't even think about it. You just put your grocery list you know, into your iPhone and you've got an app right there that like sorts it all out, tells you what to buy, and you like get all kinds of points uh, at the grocery store for, for buying the right items. So then you go home and your daughter's like, hey, I got my report card. You know, and I and I got all A's, and you're like, wow, that's really great because uh, you're going to get a special bonus, you know, from the from the government um, that's going to go towards a scholarship, and I'm going to get the good parenting bonus uh, that I that I'm going to use towards my tax return. And you say, hey, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, did you practice your piano? And uh, and she says, well, yeah. And you say, well, what score did you get? And she'll say, well, I, you know, I got 150000 And you're like, yeah, 150000 That's the best you ever got on that Sonata. You're going to get points from the Arts Council that also goes towards a scholarship. So that's a good day there. So go you. So it's been a busy day. So you're going to finally, you've had enough of this. You're going you're gonna to watch some TV. And, of course, this is just a, a game extravaganza. Because since there's like a three-dimensional camera on top of the TV that can t track where your eyes are, we know what you're looking at, where you're looking. And so this is like a game. So for, for watching different ads, you're going to get points. And your remote has a little screen on it with a camera um, so that you can kind of interact with, you know, play a little. You know, the TV shows can be games. The commercials can be games. And since there's a camera on there and, you're, and it's Facebook connected, you can see which of your friends are online, what shows they're watching right now. You can have a little Skype conversation with them right through the remote because you're both watching the same, same shows. And in fact, there's games you can play together while you're watching the TV, trivia games that are integrated into the TV shows. And so this is going to be like a game extravaganza here. It'll be points and points and points and points and points just all over the place watching TV. 
So finally, you're going to go to bed and you're like, I'm just going to do a little reading before I go to bed and you've got your new Kindle 3.0 and that's cool. And is there a game here? Well, yeah, actually there is because the, the Kindle's got an eye tracker on it that can sense where your eyes are looking, which is partly cool because if you stare at a word for more than three seconds, it automatically pops up a definition which is really useful, um, but also they can track every word that you've read. And so Amazon knows uh, whether you've read the whole book. And if you've read the whole book, when you put a review online, they'll give you a lot more points, which you can use for, you know, to buy more books later if, if, they, if you've done a review where you've read the whole book, whereas opposed to if you've just skimmed it. And so you finish reading it and you unlock an achievement um, because Microsoft bought Amazon. Did I mention that? Anyway, on Achievement Unlocked, 500 novels. And at first you're feeling kind of excited and proud about that, but then you're a little embarrassed because you're like, man, my 500th novel was this kind of crummy Star Trek novel. And people are going to remember that forever. It took me 20 years to read 500 novels. And so that's a little embarrassing. And then, of course, it makes you think a little bit because things are different here in this world where everything's tracked all the time. You know, when you think, well, what books did my grandparents read? What did, what did my grandparents like do each day? You, you don't know. That information's lost. But for us, all this information is going to be tracked and remembered forever. Our, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren are going to know every book we read, every television show we ever watched, every game we played. They're going to know everything we did. And as you think about that, you may start to think, wow, maybe, maybe I should do a little better. Maybe I should uh, try and strive for something better if, if everyone's going to remember what I did. Anyway, there you go. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we might have a few questions from the audience. All right, I'm going to I'm going to cut back to the video here. Here we go. Yeah. So, if anybody in here has any questions, my Twitter flow just died. So, just IRL questions, please. Anyone want to ask? Here we go. I'll uh, move so I'm actually in the picture. So, I want to ask you what your thoughts are on the difference between designing uh, games for the computer screen or the television screen and designing games that are in the real world. Do you have any thoughts on, on as a game designer, what, what's the difference? Oh, yeah. So, there are some big differences, I think, between those kinds of games, uh, what we call pervasive games that are out in the real world and games that are uh, on the screen. I guess, I mean, some of the mechanics are the same. You know, um, the, the ideas of rewards and the psychology of giving out rewards. But one of the challenges is feedback. One of the great advantages we have when you're playing a game on a screen is when you do something right, we can just ba-ding! You know, we just do it right there and right away. Um, so with e when you start making games out in the real world, you have to, like, look at, like, what are the feedback systems um, that that you can interact with. And I think that's one of the things that makes games either strong or weak. When people find ways to make real world games that have strong feedback systems, they work well. When they don't, it's a little trickier. And uh, we have a question as well. As well. Uh, in a future like this, do you think we will be more satisfied or more stressful when everything turns into a game? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that in some, I think there's going to be some opportunities for both because when more things are game-like, one of the things that we like about games is that games are very, they very concretely tell you how well you've done. That's one thing we like. You know, most things in life, you know, you you know you 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 I don't know you you finish something for work um, or you've got something going on in a relationship. Well, how did you do? Well. It's hard to say. You know, maybe I did okay. It's all very subjective. But uh, in a game, it's like, yep, you know, you got five out of five coins. Level up. And you know that you just did it right. So to the extent that um, we can find ways to quantify our success in new areas, we'll probably find that very satisfying. But on the other hand, uh, we are going to, these games are going to be trying to pressure us to do things that we may not be so interested in doing. And it is going to be a lot more noise coming at us. So it's going to be some of both. 
questions. Thank you. Any more questions? We'll just one more question coming up. I'm so far, I don't know if you can. Oh, I'm on the screen. Uh, when everything becomes a game, do you f find there's a danger in conformity? As you, just, you said, in a game, there's a certain way of doing things to level up to get the five coins. Uh, is there a danger that we train or teach people that conformity is the only way to success? Well, that's it's it's a question of how the games are designed. Uh, if the games are about being creative and being as different as possible, uh, that's one thing. But really, what's going to happen is um, there's going to be this incredible evolutionary situation going on where people are going to put all these games out in the marketplace trying to compete for your attention and it's going to be the games that people like playing the best the ones that they find the most rewarding are going to be the ones that stick and you know people don't like to have to all do the same thing people like autonomy people like to be able to kind of do things their way and so it's 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 going to be an interesting balance. We're going to find out what, what people like the best. Any more? Okay, thank you so much. That's really sure. been a pleasure. A big hand for Mr. Yessichel. <laughs>